Welcome to week 11. We're almost done. Getting there. Um, so today's topic is um, one that's really important when it comes to planning how you're going to use a database. There's two ways of actually taking this topic on. There's the, hey, I'm going to use transactions as part of what I'm doing. Or I want to write software to generate transactions. We're going to do the first version. In other words, I'm going to show you guys how to use them, what you'd use them for. We're not going to go into the algebraic math required to understand how they actually work on the inside. Um, there's actually dedicated university courses for this. Um, if you want to know how they work on the inside, that means you're going to be writing code for the actual database engine. So you're going to be contributing to MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, not writing an application that uses them. So difference in the in the concepts. All right. So transactions. A transaction is an action or a series of actions carried out by a single user or an application that basically uh, updates the contents of a database. Um, in other words, an insert, update, or delete, sometimes truncate. Those are what normally would be involved in a transaction. Obviously, the select can be involved too, but those don't actually modify the, the, the data. So a transaction is a logical unit of work on a database. Uh, each transaction does something in the database, and no part of it alone achieves anything of use or interest. Now, Before I dive into this slide, so in MySQL and Postgres, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, what they have by default is something set as auto commit. It means that every single time you run a command, it's assuming that that single command counts as a transaction. Oracle, on the other hand, goes the other way around where you have to explicitly turn on commit or you have to force the commits to happen. It's going to make more sense in a minute in a minute but it's just be aware by default mysql is auto commit so you've experienced it you've run an insert statement last semester and the data magically showed up in your table you didn't have to do anything special to it it just was there that's because it's in auto commit mode all right so a transaction is a unit of recovery um Consistency and integrity. Specifically, transactions have four properties. Uh, there's an acronym that's fairly easy to remember. It's ACID, which stands for atomic, consistent, isolation, and durable. Um, you'll notice in parentheses there's a different wording for it because depending on which textbook you read, they'll either use atomic or atomicity, consistent or consistency, but essentially it's the same thing. It's the property of the transaction. All right. So A for atomic. Transactions are atomic. Conceptually, they do not have any parts. They cannot be executed partially. And it should not be detectable that they interleave with another transaction. So that sounds like a lot of big words. Um, the example I always use, and I'm pretty sure I've got slides with this already, is transferring money in a bank account. Okay. When you transfer money in a bank account, what's really happening is a couple of different steps. It's not just, hey, I'm going to take uh, 50 bucks from my savings to put into my checking account because Loblaws just ripped me off again. Right? You need to transfer $50. How many people here know? Stuff about accounting. A little bit. A little bit of accounting, nobody? Okay. In accounting, every time you move money, you do two entries, a credit and a debit. When you transfer money from one account to the other, you debit one account and then you credit the other account. So assuming it's two steps. 
the tran the two steps combined is a transfer. That's considered one unit of work. In other words, both steps have to work for it to count as being atomic. You cannot eat the two steps individually are not atomic. The two steps together is atomic. In other words, it is one task. Both every piece of that must complete. Realistically, there's more to it than that because it adds records to a log, it does some validation, it's a bunch of other things, but essentially that's what it does, is it transfers money from one place to the other. Even though there's more than one step, if any of the steps fails, the entire thing fails. Therefore, whether it's one step or 25 steps, it's considered atomic as, when, as in one unit of work. If any of it fails, the whole thing fails. That's what it means by it can be executed partially. Uh, another one I like to use for this as an example is getting out of bed in the morning. Okay, you're laying in bed, you're on your back, blankets up to your neck. I've actually had to go with that detailed in the past because people were difficult. Alarm goes off. How do you get out of bed? Right? A lot of people learn this in programming also, you know, describe all the steps to get your ass out of bed. But by the same token, if any step to the point where vertical fails, getting out of bed failed, right? You turn off the alarm, you closed your eyes, you fell back asleep, congratulations, the task failed. Any of the steps from horizontal to vertical fails, the whole thing fails. It's atomic. Getting out of bed is a single task. Consistency. Consistency means a transaction will take the database from one consistent state to another. The middle of the transaction, the database might not be consistent. In other words, if it fails, it should have, it's as if it never even happened. So again, back to the money transfer example, you have $100 in this account, $50 in this account. You transfer $50 from here to there. You had $150 when you started. You have $150 when you ended. But at one point, you will have $200 between the start and the end because you got to take money out of one to add to the other. So either you are going to have $100 or $200, depends what banking system they're using. But if it fails, the whole thing, as if it never happened, therefore you're still at $150. And when it completes, it should still be $150. It should be consistent with what was there before. Isolation. The effects of a transaction are not visible to other transactions until it has completed. From anything happening on the outside, it's as if the transaction is not even does not even exist. So this is a consequence of being atomic. So a transaction starts. Other people are using the database. Until that transaction completes, anybody else outside that transaction should not see what's happening inside that transaction because it's self-contained, it's atomic. Even if it's doing 25 steps, everybody in the outside shouldn't see the individual steps. They should see this is what was before, this it was was after. While that's happening, it's isolated. It happens in its own little snapshot. Durable. Once a transaction completes, its changes that are, that are made are permanent. Even if the system crashes, the effects of a transaction must remain in place. So in other words, transaction completes, get checkpoint gets added, should be done. Okay, now, transferring the money. Remember a minute ago I said I actually have a slide on this. So we want to transfer $50 from account A to account B. So, all the steps in the transaction would be read A, right? We read account A, then we do account A minus 50, also known as a debit. We read B, then we do B plus 50, and we write B. It's atomic. You shouldn't be able to take money from A without giving it to B. Back in the day, these things could happen. Computers are really, really slow. Um, but it shouldn't happen. Consistency. Money is not lost or gained. So before the start of the transaction, 
at the end of the transaction, it should still stay consistent. Isolation. Other queries shouldn't see A or B until it's completed. Durability. Once it's done, the money should magically reappear in account A. Now, a lot of people that talk about transaction like using money for this. Why? Because it's something everybody understands. Most people have more than one bank account, so you understand about transferring money. Um, and three, the banks invented the concept of transactions in computing. I mean, we all, I mean, the whole concept of transactions has existed since the dawn of time. You know, you get a, you give a rabbit, you get berries. There's a transaction. Two rabbits don't magically appear and suddenly the berries don't magically disappear. There's always transactions. The banking industry is the ones that pushed for having computing style transactions where things are consistent. All right, so the transaction manager. So we've talked about different parts of the database engine. We talked about the SQL optimizer when we're talking about the indexes and stuff. There's something called the transaction manager. So the transaction manager is this chunk of code that lives inside of a database server that basically sits there and says, is there a transaction happening? And it, it manages and handles everything involved inside the transaction. So it will do a bunch of things. It will lock records as needed. <laughs> really good database engines will actually lock columns. Um, so it creates locks, creates timestamps, so that each, um, what's the word I'm looking for? So each transaction is self-contained and it can't be affected by outside things. Um, I don't know why this says next lectures. I thought I cleaned, cleaned that out. Um, but anyways, a log is kept to ensure durability in the event of system failure. That's what we're doing in this lecture. Um, the transaction manager enforces ACID. It schedules the operations of transactions and commit and rollback are the two commands that ensure consistency. And make sure the command is atomic. I have a hard time saying at atomicity. It doesn't want to come out. Um, so I'll, I'll be doing a whole demo. So with transactions, there's actually three commands. <clears throat> the first one is begin. Uh, so then we have the to end command. So begin's pretty obvious. Begin starts the transaction, begin transaction. Um, some database servers require you to actually type in begin space transaction. Most databases will just accept the word begin. Um, and you do all your stuff that you want to do in the middle. And then you, at the end, Either you issue a command called rollback or you issue a command called commit. Rollback signals that something went wrong. So programmatically, you can choose to undo whatever you just did if you're running it in a transaction. Last semester, you probably learned that there's no such thing as undo in a database server. You do an insert, it's in the database. You do a delete, it's gone. If you're running it inside of a transaction, you do get an undo. But it undoes everything you did since the begin, kind of. So any changes made by the transaction, transaction should be undone. It's as if the transaction never even happened. So essentially all the changes are buffered in memory. Once you either do a rollback or commit, if you roll back, it just deletes whatever's in memory. If you commit, the database server at that point will take all those commands you ran and writes them to the disk. So rollback basically clears the buffer like it never even happened. In your programming class, imagine you're unsetting a variable. So you have a variable, you did a bunch of changes to it, and suddenly you say, oh, this isn't what I want. So um, I don't know how you do it in Python, but in PHP it's literally called unset. And you unset a variable and magically the data is gone. Commit takes the data and writes it out. Okay, I'm actually going to do my demo now instead of at the end. So, because 
it's the good spot to do it, and then I'll get to the rest. So I've got a database with just one table. It's called Transdemo. This will be really important for the lab. So for those of you that like to struggle during the labs, this is a good time to pay attention. So you go new query console, new query console. Notice I've got two consoles open. All right. Now, just to prove that I'm looking at the same database, All right, copy, go to this console and run it. So the two are giving me the same output. Cool. Now I'm going to type in a begin. And now I'm going to go insert into trans demo name values Bob. Okay. And I'm going to select star from friends demo. All right. We see three commands. Begin. Begin is telling the database server, this is a transaction that is not auto commit. You will do what I tell you to do when I tell you to do it. I'm going to insert a row and then I'm going to select from it. So I'm going to go run and I'm going to take the whole thing. It's important to do the whole thing. Okay, so here's Bob. You see Bob down here magically appeared. Let's go to my other one and I run this. Look, there's no Bob. Hit the run again. I am talking to the same database table. What's happened is in this table, the transaction is currently in process. The record was added to the table, but it hasn't been committed. So in memory, this transaction's basically got a, a stranglehold on the table. And until I tell it to either commit or roll back, as far as inside that transaction, that record exists, but it doesn't exist outside. This is isolation. Each connection is isolated from the other. Whatever one does, the other one does not see. All right, so currently the database, as far as console six is concerned, the database is consistent because it hasn't done anything. Currently in this transaction, the database is in an inconsistent state because there's changes that have been made, but they haven't been written to the disk. Therefore, there's changes in memory. So what I can do is I can issue a commit command. All right, I'm going to run commit. And I'm going to select start, proof to you that Bob is still there. I'm going to go to my other window and I'm going to hit run. And now Bob's now showing up in my second connection. So what happened is I told the database server, begin a transaction. I make some changes, could be one, could be 10, could be 20, whatever. And until I commit that change, it's not available to anybody else. Now, I am going to begin this dem this transaction one more time. Okay, this time I'm going to add Jim. I'm going to run it. So you can see Jim exists here, but does not exist here. Okay. Now I'm going to do a rollback. And if I select from the trans demo, Jim is gone. Because I said, hey, well, I just did something wrong. Let's roll it back. And then if obviously over here, this also stayed consistent because it never even happened as far as the database server is concerned. Okay, so here's some cute tricks. Now, let's make a, another change. I'm going to go update. Friends demo set name equal to uh, Bobby, where ID is equal to 21. All right, so 
Bob has decided he's now identified by Bobby instead. Okay? Cool. I go to my other window. And obviously Bob is still there. Let's go and change. And now I'm going to try to run an update here. Now, it's really hard to see, but have you noticed? Look at back here where my mouse is. You can see that the... Right here. See there's a countdown, the counter. It's going up and up and up and up and up. Okay. Essentially what's happened is I started a transaction. I'm operating on row 21. It's in a transaction. It's begun. It's not rolled back or committed. Meantime, I am trying to update row 21 a second time. You can't change the same thing twice, both of them at the same time. Therefore, what happens? Currently, in the transaction, the row is locked. Nobody can change it. Theoretically, and now I just timed out, right? Uh, actually, if I was using MySQL Workbench, this would run until I stopped talking. MySQL Workbench doesn't do timeouts. Okay, so if I go here and I go select star from trans demo, it's still as is, all right? Right now, let's go make sure that this one hasn't ex expired on me. Bobby's still around, cool. All right, so I'm going to run this whole block again. Okay, you can see the countdown started again. But over here, I'm going to go issue a commit. Now you can see the other console ended right away. And if I select over here, you will notice that the data says Jenny, not Bobby. So this is demonstrating that things happen in the order that they're issued. So you begin a transaction, you're modifying a record. This could apply to be deleting a row amongst other things, all right? So you're making changes to the database in a transaction, the rows are locked. Stuff is happening in another connection and it's waiting for the first one to finish. The second one, the second, the first one is finished. The second one double checks, make sure it can still do what it's supposed to be able to do. And then it does it. So, what does that tell you? Last command to run wins. No, oh, really. That's literally it. Last one to run wins. Even if you've got a transaction that's been sitting there forever, once the first one's done, it's going to do whatever else wants to happen to there at this, as soon as it's available. Now, we are going to, instead of this, we are going to Okay, so I'm going to begin. Okay, we can see that Bobby's been deleted. I'm going to try to update this to um, to Joan. I'm going to hit the run button. And again, you can see that it's doing its thing. I commit. You'll see right down here that it completed. but it's gone. Really what would have happened here is, um, this is one of the few weird things that, the this doesn't show you very well what it did. Um, you'll actually see right here where it says uh, one row affected. But in here I did this instead, but it says it completed. They didn't say there was a row affected because the row no longer existed. So essentially, this is the case where if something gets deleted, something else will um, not be able to change it if it doesn't exist anymore. So in the last 10 minutes, I demonstrated the entire lab. Because so you know, it's different tables, but this is the entire lab, just, just so you know, okay? It's really not complicated, yes. Yeah. 
Um, actually, here, let's go try to run it again and see what happens. Because MySQL doesn't think it's an error. Because it's not an error, it just didn't find it. Errors happen when your SQL is incorrect. If it finds nothing, it's not an error, it just didn't find anything. It's a bit different from what you're used to, say, in Python, where you try to delete something from an array, then the element doesn't exist, and then it shits the bed because you threw you didn't check to see if that existed before you tried to nuke the array element. In database, Basically put, if it doesn't find something, it assumes it just wasn't there. And there's nothing to do, so it just moves on. Like, it carries on with its day. Which is why it says completed, not affected. So if I go... Um, okay, Julie decides to become Joan. I run this. And if you look at the output, it shows that one row was affected, right? Be okay, that was a little scary. Um, one row was affected, not otherwise it says completed because it says, hey, I finished doing this. I just didn't find anything. If you're doing it like at the command prompt for MySQL, use MySQL Workbench, it'll actually return with zero rows affected. Different tools will give you different output. But in the end, it's the same thing. If it says that no rows were affected, there's no rows to be affected. Oh, it's, it's just how um, data grip works. It grabs the output, basically the output of the commands in one tab and the results of the query in the other. Like when I do this, you can see here, here's the output of the results, but this is the, uh, the output of the select statement. It's a workbench thing. Okay. Now back to the slides. But that is essentially how transactions work. Whether you're doing one thing or more than one, that's what they do. So for example, a real world example would be um, you are shopping on an online website. You add, add a bunch of things to your shopping cart and then you check out. You don't get an order number until after you've checked out, right? And when you are saving your data to the shopping cart, to the order, it has to make sure that the entirety goes in in one go. So it begins the transaction, it creates the order, and then it adds each of the order lines, does whatever other little magic math it needs to the database, and then it commits it. If any of the inserts fails, the whole thing fails because you shouldn't be able to save a partial order. Right? Like if you buy three t-shirts and you check out and you give them the money, for three t-shirts and suddenly the order fails and it only adds two t-shirts to the order, but they took money for three t-shirts. That's not a good thing. Therefore that runs in a transaction. Begin, blah, 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 commit. That is the big purpose for transactions. It's like in banks, when you transfer money from one place to another, when you place an order to make sure that all the records are created properly, an order gets shipped. You need to make sure you update all the right pieces in the database as a single transaction. Otherwise you might, you know, if there's an error, the database may become inconsistent with the state it needs to be in. Okay, so back to recovery. Kind of ties into last week's lecture about backup and restore. So prevention is better than the cure because when a transaction fails, sometimes you have to recover. Um, before we, the transaction concept can save you from a lot of grief, but it can't protect you from everything. Um, obviously you should have a reliable operating system. 
Um, you should have good security. Probably have some UPSs in there somewhere. For those of you that don't know what UPS is, they're uninterruptible power supplies. They're basically a battery. You plug the computer into a battery and the battery plugs into the wall. The power goes out. Things keep running until, you know, your battery dies or the power comes back. Uh, RAID arrays. Um, I know for a fact you guys don't learn about RAID arrays. Uh, RAID arrays stands for redundant array of independent disks. You put in four hard drives and you set up, you know, some RAID scheme. There's many, many kinds of RAID. Um, and basically put, you can make sure the data is written across multiple disks, so often with parity bits and mirrors to make sure that if you lose a drive, you don't lose, actually lose anything. Um, but you can't protect against everything. So a transaction should be durable, but a system might crash. There might be a power failure. The hard drive itself dies. Um, user mistakes, sabotage, natural disasters. Now, user mistakes and sabotage transactions can't do much for that. However, a transaction should be, the transaction manager should be able to make you recover from all the others. So, database servers maintain something called a transaction log. Remember last week I talked about the binary log where every command being issued to the database gets written? And then every time there's a checkpoint, it reads the contents of that log and runs it. Whenever you begin a transaction, something similar happens. You begin a transaction, a transaction log is initiated, and it records the details of all the transactions. So any changes the data transaction makes to the database, it also keeps track of how to undo these changes, when it completed, and whether it was successful or not. The log is stored on disk, not in memory. This is if this is in case the server literally blue screens. If it's a Windows server, or on Linux, it has a what they call a kernel panic. On Mac, it's like the bong of death. Um, I'm sure if has anybody here on a, with a Mac here experienced the bong of death yet? No. It literally goes bong. Yeah, not that bong, bruh. That might explain a lot. Um, but yeah, the Macs make this sound and then they got this message, the sound of death. Um, it's the only computer I know, like Linux machines will go beep, 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 and they just start beeping. Literally, that's the last thing they do. They just beep until they just turn off. Well, those of us had a blue screens of death on Windows know what it does, right? It says, hey, something went wrong. I'm going to try to reboot now. Whether it should or not, it's going to reboot. And, uh, yeah. So the log is actually stored on disk. So every single time you start a transaction, you issue a command for the transaction. The very first thing it does is it writes it to that log file before it tries to do anything else. And then if it's the command succeeds, it tells it's written in the log, this actually worked. Then it does the next command, this actually worked. Oh, the log completed, fantastic. It commits it and it says this succeeded and finished. So it's known as the write ahead log. And the write ahead log is a limited file. All the commands get written in there before it even hits the drive. So an entry in the log must be made before commit processing can happen. So when there's a system failure at various times, the database takes what's called a checkpoint. So it looks at the, tra the transaction log. It knows the last time it did a checkpoint and it starts reading through the transaction log. And it looks at anything that committed till it hits the end of that transaction log. There might be transactions in there that aren't committed yet. So if it's committed and it succeeded, it actually marks those as done, leaves the other ones unmarked. And essentially that file contains what's happening. So a system failure means that everything that is currently running is affected. So whether it's a software crash, power failure, as long as the physical disks are not damaged, you're probably good. If the physical disk where the write ahead log is written dies, you got big problems. If the physical disks um, 
die and there hasn't been a backup, you also got a problem, right? But theoretically, it, there should be stuff in place to handle that. All right, so I'm gonna, I've got a chart here and I'm gonna actually be going through this chart in a second. So for this next set of examples, there's five transactions. There's gonna be, the starting point is over here. This is, the server has died. So it goes bong, it goes beep, 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 or it decides to reboot, as the case may be. All right, so transactions that was running at the time of failure need to be undone and restarted. Any transactions that committed since the last checkpoint need to be redone. All right, so transactions of type T1 need no recovery. So right now, transaction one starts and time goes forward. Transaction three starts, transaction two starts, and this picture that the time travels this way, all right? Transaction one completed. So transaction one is complete. Then there's a checkpoint. Checkpoint means it takes the results of that transaction and actually writes it to the disk. It's committed to the drive now. It's permanent. That's why it says that transactions that fall in the same category as T1 don't need to be recovered because they've been committed to the disk. Type three and five need to be undone because they never finished. Two and four need to be redone. All right, so, which leads me to the undo redo. Undo, you need to undo all the transactions since the last checkpoint. So in the transaction log, there's literally three states. Done, undo, redo. Done is self-explanatory. I don't need to explain that concept to you guys, right? Done means it's type, type one. It's written to the disk. It made it past the checkpoint. Good, we don't need to think about it anymore. Undo, so all transactions running since the last checkpoint. Redo is empty. So essentially after the checkpoint, redo is empty. For each entry in the log, starting from the last checkpoint, if a begin transaction entry is found, he gets added, the transaction gets added to undo. If a commit entry is found, it gets added to from undo to redo. All right. So currently transaction one started, transaction two started, transaction three started. Okay. The time is moving. Transaction one completes. Checkpoint fires off. Okay. Right now we have two and three are in the undo pile because they haven't been committed to the disk, they haven't completed, but they are currently running while the checkpoint occurred. So another checkpoint is when it writes it to the tables permanently. So time travel, time, time continues, right? So this green line is going to keep moving. Transaction four begins. So right now we have two, three, and four are all currently running. So T4, transaction four, gets added to the undo pile. So in the log, two, three, and four have never finished yet. They're currently in a state of undo because they haven't been committed. We don't know if they're gonna complete properly. It's undo. Transaction five begins. Guess what? Transaction five goes to the undo pile also. Because at this point in time, two, three, four, nor five, and so none of these have finished. They're still running. Therefore, right now they're all in the undo pile because nothing completed. If the server were to suddenly die right now, all four need to be undone as if they never happened because we don't want to leave the database in an inconsistent state. Transaction two commits. So Transaction two finishes. The code says the application, whatever happens to be doing it, says it worked, I'm happy with this, issue commit command. Just like I did in my example, I issued a commit command and it magically showed up in the table. So transaction two goes into the redo pile. Because don't forget, we've already gone past the checkpoint and we haven't reached the next checkpoint. So in the transaction log, it says transaction two succeeded. 
if the server were to die right now, we are able to redo transaction two. So we're going to redo transaction two. Line moves on some more. Transaction four commits. Transaction four now goes into the redo pile. You notice that three and five have not committed yet. <clears throat> I keep forgetting that I accidentally deleted the next slide. So the next thing that happens is this green line comes here. Failure. Somebody was cleaning in the server room. They weren't paying attention. They pulled a plug out of the back of the server. I wish I could say I've never seen that, but I have. Almost that exact situation. They were cleaning up the wires and they unplugged the wrong server. They had a server that was non-responsive. It wasn't responding to the console and the button was dead. So they go to the back and they go, I, with this machine, we, we're going to retire anyway. So we're done with it. Reaches in the back. Can't tell which server is the one that's running because they're all on. Grabs the wire, unplugs it, and he pulled the database server. Not the other one that wasn't important. So yes, I've seen it. But so failure means the server has had a critical failure. Whatever caused that failure, power outage, hard drive, out of memory, out of disk space, insert whatever reason here, the whole thing just shits the bed. Everybody's now having a bad day. Transaction three and five never finished. Therefore, they have to be undone. So here's what's cool about the transaction log. Notice I've said that two and four into the redo pile, they're still in the transaction log, marked as in they've never been committed. There's not, has, there has not been a checkpoint yet, but they were able to be run successfully. So server person goes into the room, you know, fixes the machine, turns it back on, server boots, database service starts. So MySQL, Postgres, whatever starts. What it does at that point, it goes, huh, my last checkpoint was two days ago. Let's check the transaction log. It looks at the transaction log and goes, huh, there's two here I'm supposed to redo. So it'll actually redo those two commands and then mark that as the next checkpoint. So it'll let, before it even brings up the database available to users, it'll play back the transaction log and find any that are completed, but we're not checkpointed yet. It'll finish off anything that's marked as redo. And it basically the undos never even happened. So transaction two, transaction four will be committed to the disk after the reboot. And then the server makes itself available to the rest of the world. And it's as if nothing bad ever happened. We've got transactions one, two, and four still valid. Three and five never finished. Now there's risks with this situation. What happens if uh, transaction three and transaction five were accessing the same records or transaction five was accessing tra what happened to transaction one or something that was happening in transaction two and it was waiting, right? There's, there's a few little risks of that whole connection one, connection two doing changes, but there's only so much you can do to handle this. Um, some database servers, what they'll do is they'll mark uh, any interdependent transactions that are failing as a group. So let's say three fails and the server fails and four was depending on three, it would fail four also. Different database servers do it differently. So, you know, uh, this is where I tend to say, learn how your database server treats transactions. They all do it a little bit differently. Some are better than others. I try not to think about MySQL too much. It has, it's a little challenged uh, when it comes to transactions compared to other like Oracle or IBM DB2, Postgres, Microsoft SQL Server. Um, everything that's past a certain class of server, you probably don't need to think about it too hard, but you should still find out what it's, um, what they call the transaction strategies it uses as, as in what happens when things go bad. Um, most servers are really, really fast and the odds of that situation happening is really small. But if you're talking like a banking system where you got millions of transactions a second, it's probably pretty important to know what the database server is going to do if it fails. 
Uh, but that is, like I said, it's engine specific. So wherever you end up working, and if they use transactions, you should really find out how the transactions behave, just so that you're aware. Okay, so we have forward and backward recovery. So the server reboots, we hit the system crash, we fix the machine, we bring it back up. Now we're gonna do a forward and a backward recovery. Forward recovery means some transactions need to be redone. So it works from the, bat, the, the start of the log, working its way towards the end, and it looks for anything on the redo list and it does them one after another. It'll bring, make sure the database is up to date. At the same time, it reads from the back of the log, working its way backwards for anything that's still in the undo log. And it works backwards, basically erasing the transactions that need to be undone because they can't be completed because they never actually finished. This will return the database to a consistent state so that there's no half finished transactions. It clears it up. So it literally runs from both ends at the same time. And it applies what needs to be done this way and it deletes what it needs this way. So media failures when it comes to transactions. Um, media failures are more serious. The data stored on the disk is damaged. The transaction log itself might be damaged. Um, literally losing hard drives is the worst case scenario. That's why you tend to want to make sure you're running your database on a redundant type environment where the, it's on redundant disks. Um, a good example, and really big enterprises will do this, you'll have Basically, a series of drives. Okay. Really big RAID array. So the way it works is most, a RAID array will have disks and it shares them. So for example, a RAID zero, yeah, RAID zero mirrors. So you can say this disk is always mirrored to this disk. So if you lose this disk, you can get it back from this one. RAID 1, we don't talk about that because it's called striping. It's done for performance. It's really easy to lose your data. But they have another one, another, another couple called um, a 0 plus 1, which is a stripe, which is basically the data spread across all the disks, but it also mirrors the entire stripe a second time. So you got two copies of the entire thing. Better, but still, if you lose one disk, you're still in trouble because you still potentially could lose data. The most common one you'll have is called a RAID 5. So what RAID 5 will do is it'll use, um, a, say, six disks. And over those six disks, it reserves a chunk of this each disk for what they call parity information. So that if you lose this drive and you replace it, it'll rebuild it from the data on the other drives. And you have one here that's here for a hot swap. So this drive dies, the RAID array automatically switches to this one and rebuilds itself with this one. And it tells you to replace this drive and puts it as the hot. So the, what they, the one step past this is what they call a RAID 50, RAID 5.0, which is it does the RAID 5 and then it you know copies the entire thing. So you've got two copies of the same one. So places like the government, they use basically a RAID 50. Uh, there's also RAID 6 and a few others, but RAID 5 is the most common one people use. And basically it spreads the data across multiple, multiple disks. You can lose a disk. For every parity disk you have, you can recover that many disks theoretically, and it mirrors them. So if you lose this entire RAID array, you can still recover from the second one. It's used for the important stuff. This is expensive, just, just so you know. Um, I am running a RAID 5 on one of my machines at home, and uh, it's uh, $800 worth of hard drives. Five drives. But I got the drives for free, so, you know. But it's $800 worth of hard drives sitting in an enclosure that are mirroring each other. 
Uh, I got stuff on there I don't want to lose. So. So. Do you have to have backups? What we talked about last week. So you got to do it frequent enough that if you have hard drive failure, you don't lose too much data. Um, nightly is usually the good idea. Uh, backups are needed to recover from media failure. And if you're really lucky, you'll have the transaction log. And you can do a restore and then replay the transaction log if you're lucky. So you restore database from backup, use the transaction log to redo any changes. Great. If the transaction log is damaged, you can't do step two, which leads us to the next statement that the transaction log should exist on its own disk. That way, if you lose, you know, part of this RAID array, but your transaction log's happily sitting in another disk somewhere else, you're not going to lose too much. All right. Then we have concurrency. So large databases are used by many people. The best example is the banks. We can all log into our bank accounts and all transfer money, send e-transfers and pay bills all at the same time. Fantastic. Um, anybody here share their bank account with someone else? Okay. Usually I get one person that says yes. So my wife and I shared a bank account. Okay. Theoretically, I could pay bills and she could do other stuff at the same time, right? The transaction manager would make sure that whatever changes we did didn't affect each other. And big database systems will have something called concurrency. It's to preserve isolation from each other. So you already saw it when I was doing the demo to you guys where I started a transaction in one and it wouldn't let the other one do anything until the first one finished. That's called concurrency locking. It's basically making sure that the changes from one cannot affect the other until the first one commits. Way back in the day, we didn't do concurrency. We did sequential. Now, imagine nowadays if the way the banking works, you make a change to your bank account. She makes a change. Let's, say, let's pretend you're all in the same bank. You make a change to your bank account, it starts a transaction. You can't make your changes until she finishes her changes, even though it's not even the same bank account. That's sequential. So it does the first one, finishes it, does the second one, finishes it, does the third one, finishes it. It will add processing time and eventually you get this huge backlog of transactions that needs to happen and they can't because it's waiting. So they came up with concurrency where you do something, you do something, they can happen at the same time, what the transaction manager does goes, hmm, are they operating on the same row? Really good database engines will go, hey, they're working on the same row. Are they touching the same columns? Like Postgres, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, IBM DB2, you'll notice I'm using big company names here, not the smaller ones. Um, they actually have column level concurrency. So unless you're modifying the entire row or you're inserting an entire row or you're deleting a row, depending on what the command you're doing, it may actually allow another command to actually sneak in and make changes at the same time because it doesn't affect the other transaction. So that's concurrency. It's allowing multiple changes to happen to the same table at the same time, as long as they don't touch the same thing. The second they start touching the same things, we're back to she goes first, you go second. Okay, so your takeaway from this lecture is understanding the fact that you can control blocks of commands so they run all as a single thing. It's important to make sure it's because you don't want to make sure your database doesn't blow up and you don't corrupt data. You don't put in half set chunks of data because in a complicated database system, you don't have one, two or three tables. You might have hundreds of tables and a single transaction might modify rows in, or add rows or delete rows in, you know, four, five, six tables at once for a single for a single task. 
Transaction makes sure that the whole thing happens as a unit. That's what's important. That's the important takeaway. Oh, and knowing that it's uh, begin, commit, or rollback. <laughs> That's the other important takeaway. Um, the lab is very similar to what I just did. It's a different table. Uh, it's actually using that credit union table, if I remember right. And basically, I'm getting you transferring money from one account to the other account. Right? And uh, you're going to make sure that you can't change the values while the transaction is happening. Um, at least that's what I remember the lab being. Um, outside of that, uh, that is it. Um, like I said, you don't need to know the nitty gritty of how it works. It's more, what does it, like you need to know how to use it, like begin, commit, roll back. And there's actually some more things you can do to a transaction than this, but the problem is that not all servers do it the same way. So I decided to not include it in the lectures at all anymore where you can put markers and actually partial rollbacks and stuff. And it's, MySQL does it one way, Oracle does it a different way, Postgres does it a different way, and they don't, they're not consistent in how they do the partial rollback stuff. So there's no point covering that unless you actually need it for your job. And I've been doing this for 26 years and I've never used a partial rollback. So maybe I've just been lucky. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, next week, is going to be interesting. Uh, normally I'm able to cover the last two weeks worth of material in one day because they're related to each other. And I've learned over the years that it's usually better to, if the two topics are pretty much the same, cover it all at once. Um, you get to actually program with the content from next week. You get to flex your programming muscles a little which is kind of what you're in school for. So, all right. Um, any questions before I stop the recording? Going once, going twice, hold your peace.